Hello, and welcome back to Sociology 101. Today, we're going to talk about what's recently come out in social media about Dr. Uh, Maxwell, who has um, been known for his writings uh, from the reform perspective. Uh, he was writer for Desiring God Ministries. Uh, I, he's a very intelligent individual based upon uh, what I've experienced in listening to him and reading his, his work. He's a very good author. And, uh, and Paul Maxwell recently uh, denounced his faith uh, in a sense of saying, I'm no longer a Christian. Um, now, on that, on that note, um, as many of you know, you know, we have differing perspectives on what it means to lose your faith or to walk away from the faith and how that can play itself out. And that's not really what this program is uh, attempting to address. And I don't know Paul Maxwell's heart. Um, as is often said, God can see the root. We can only see the fruit. I don't know where he is in his faith journey. I don't know what has led him to this uh, conclusion, whether it's a temporary thing, whether it's going to be maybe just a, a jaunt into a, a hero's journey, as you'll hear him reference uh, later in another broadcast. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know uh, much about Paul, obviously. Um, God does. God knows his heart. God knows what he's going through. And what I do know for a fact is that God loves him, that Jesus Christ died for him, and that I long to see his for his salvation. And I think my God does too. I think Christ genuinely loves Paul. Um, and that that is what's essential here, is that regardless of where he is in his faith journey, what I think we as Christians universally should be able to say and do is to call him to repentance and faith, knowing full well that God desires that for him, that God wants that for him, and that God wants him to be a person who honors God, that knows God, that has a real relationship with him. Now, one of the things that I appreciate um, about people who are struggling in this, this way of faith is this generation, younger generations, are very honest about what they're dealing with when they're dealing with doubts or they're dealing with uh, disillusionment and these kinds of things. Listen, Paul Maxwell, his livelihood was largely based upon uh, his writings and his work in the Reformed tradition. And when when people walk away from the faith at, at a potential great loss of their livelihood and, I mean, all of the degrees he has are from Reformed-type seminaries. I mean, he's pretty much lost all credibility and the ability to get the kinds of work that he would normally want to get within the Christian world by coming out as, as now uh, an, an unbeliever. Um, that's somebody who's incredibly honest with what he's feeling and what he's going through. Whereas I, what, what I believe there are some people who really do struggle with their faith or struggle with doubts who, because of their living, because of their situation in life would never be honest enough to come right out and say it because of the fear of losing what they have. And that's the one thing I can say that I, I commend some of these people who are willing to be honest about what they're struggling with and what they're dealing with, even at their own financial loss or their loss of career and other things. They're honest about what they're dealing with. Why is that important? Because God knows their heart. God already knows where their minds and their heart is, that he, he knows it. And they're just being outwardly honest with what is going on inside of them and their struggles. And when it comes to doing ministry as a pastor or apologist, um, evangelist like I am, if somebody's not being honest with me, how can I possibly begin to help counsel or disciple them or to, to strengthen them in their faith if they're lying about what they're struggling with or what they're going through? And so I, I just start off this broadcast by commending Paul's honesty. Um, now, some may question the method by doing this coming out on, you know, social media and just announcing this to the world that you're, you're leaving Christianity. Um, but nonetheless, what I want to commend in this is not, I don't want to shame people for being honest about what's going on inside. Why? Because if someone's tr truly struggling with their faith, truly struggling with doubt, truly struggling with questioning God's existence or questioning their relationship with the Father, I would rather that person be honest with me than fake and say that they, they don't struggle when they do. Because I think when we're honest, all of us struggle 
at times. All of us have questions. That's why apologetics exists is because there are questions and there are doubts and there are struggles. Um, there was a great sermon. I, I need to go back and find this. I thought it was a great sermon uh, by Austin Fisher who, who talks about doubt and how doubt is actually something that's a very biblical concept that goes right alongside of, of faith, um, that, that you don't really need faith unless there's doubt. And he goes through uh, teachings throughout the scripture, Thomas and the other apostles in their dealings, in their own dealings with doubt and disillusionment. Um, and and I, I thought it was a great sermon. If I can find it, I'll put a link in the show notes for you. I need to go back and find that because he just does a really good job, I think, unpacking this issue. And, and, and many, many Christians uh, go through their life dealing with some form of doubt. It's part of my testimony uh, as a church brat myself raised in the church. And one of the things is when, when the Christian life is commonplace, it's, it's common. Uh, the, the, you know, when I first, you know, I, I probably learned to quote John three sixteen before I could spell my first name for goodness sake. I mean, I was raised in the church. Well, it becomes commonplace and that sometimes leads to what complacency. It's the same root for the word. Well, you become complacent about things that are commonplace, things that are always around you. And when you're raised in the church, sometimes you can deal with doubts. I mean, I didn't have that rags to riches testimony that I heard from so many of these evangelists that would come into my church growing up who had these, you know, just awesome stories about how they used to be just horrible, bad people. And then God got a hold of their life. And now they're a full-time evangelist traveling the world, telling people about how God's changed them. I mean, when I, when I give my testimony, what can I say about my life before Christ? I was, I was saved at the age of seven. Yeah, you know, back before I became a Christian, I used to read books in bad light and I broke my brother's crayon that one time, but now I'm all better. I mean, boring. That's not a testimony. I did worse things as a Christian than I did as a, a non-Christian when you really think about it, because it's as a, a youth, a young person, oftentimes that you begin to explore and getting into all kinds of, of, of things that you can get into and the, the struggles that I had later in my life. And this is, this is the this is a struggle I think all Christians have on some level of dealing with doubt. Statistics show that over 80% of Christians admit to having struggled with doubting of their salvation. Um, and, and so when we, when we aren't honest about our doubts, then how can we get counsel and how can we seek help and how can we begin to be honest with God if we can't be honest with ourselves and we can't be honest with each other about where we struggle? And so the, I think these things are so essential to truly addressing the doubts, understanding why doubts occur, and understanding how it can actually strengthen one's faith. It was going through those doubts in my life and coming to the point of owning faith for myself and not just following my family's faith, not just following the faith of my dad or my mom, but becoming my faith, struggling through my own sin and my own journey and my own struggles with doubt was what I needed to heal that wound and to grow into maturity. And all of us need to go through those things. And I have no idea where Paul is. Paul Maxwell is on that journey. Uh, it, 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 he's a public figure because he writes publicly for Desiring God Ministries. And he's a PhD, very intellectualistic, very, very, uh, you'll, as you'll hear in this program. Um, and his journey is a public journey, and that's the only reason I'm using it in this discussion, because he's made it very public. And, and I honestly, if he ever, ever to watch this, I, I'm my desire is not to play on him and to um, use his journey to bash him over the head because he was a Calvinist and all these kinds of things, because sometimes that can be the tendency that we would have in these kinds of discussions, because we're the non-Calvinist and he's the Calvinist. And like the other Calvinists who have recently left the faith, so to speak, that we could just, you know, bash bash the Calvinist over the head because, hey, look, you lost another one kind of a situation. Listen, be honest. There are, there are just as many, if not more, uh, non-Calvinists who leave the faith as there are Calvinists. Why? Because there's less Calvinists overall in, 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 uh, among Christendom. And so don't, don't non-Calvinist, provisionist, you out there, don't take these kinds of these kinds of situations as tragic as they are and use them as hey this proves somehow that calvinism must be wrong that calvinism must be incorrect because then someone can just take the provisionist who leaves the faith and say well then provisionism must be incorrect and they can do the same that's just bad argumentation 
guilt by association. Well, this person who happened to believe what you believe did this bad thing. Therefore, what he believed must be wrong. Well, anyone and everyone could do that with Ravi Zacharias, for example. Look what he did. Therefore, everything he argued must have been wrong. That's just simply not true. That's just bad argumentation. We don't want to practice bad argumentation here. And, and, and I'm not promoting that. What, so what am I doing today? What, what is my goal in talking about Paul Maxwell and his work? Well, I had heard about Paul leaving, you know, renouncing Christianity back when it first happened. Didn't think anything of it. I mean, I didn't think anything of doing a podcast on a podcast on it because I usually don't try to, you know, jump on things like that. But it wasn't until I listened to a, a more recent podcast where he has a discussion with someone else and he talks about his dissertation, his work on trauma. And he, he has a degree in psychology as well, which is an interest to me because my wife is a, a therapist. And, um, and because of her own journey and her own dealing with the, the teachings of psychology um, and, and her own faith and how that journey happened for her and us walking together through that journey for her, there, it really did spark a lot within me. And y'all, many of you know, I've, I have been wanting to have my wife on the podcast um, and she's expressed interest in doing so. She's a little skeptical of, because she's not real big about being on film and, you know, being recorded and all those kinds of things. But uh, we're, we're working something out. Eventually it'll probably come to pass, but we're, we're still working through that. This, this just highlighted some of the things that my wife and I have discussed over the years with regard to the psychological effects that certain doctrines can have. Now, let me say this clearly. There are certain doctrines that are both consistent and unique only to Calvinist theology and other doctrines that are, 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 are across the board just Christian doctrines that can damage and can have a negative effect on people's psychological uh, walk. Um, but what this highlights, at least what I think Paul Maxwell's work highlights, is how uniquely devastating specific claims of Calvinism can have on individuals' lives. And I, I think this is important. So he wrote a dissertation, um, and it, it, it was published as a book called The Trauma of Doctrine. And that's why I put on the thumbnail the trauma of Calvinistic doctrine, because that's specifically really what he is addressing. He's not addressing the, the trauma of Christian doctrine in general. He's addressing the trauma uh, of specifically Reformed or Calvinistic doctrine in his work. In fact, you can see some of the editorial comments. This is from uh, the Amazon page that th this is on the book. And so this is not something he's trying to hide. This is really clear where it, it says, you know, Paul Maxwell examines the effect that the Calvinist belief can have upon the traumatized Christian who negatively internalizes its superlative doctrines of divine control and human corruption the chart and charts a way toward meaningful spiritual recovery. So you see that that's on the book. I mean, that's right on the, the, the cover saying that what he's, his purpose is, is to show how the Calvinistic beliefs can affect and traumatize the Christian in a negative way um, who internalizes these super, uh, the, the, you know, the, the doctrines that are of his maximal glory, which you'll hear him talk about here in, a, in, a, in just a minute, the superlative doctrines as he, he, he puts it. Um, and there's some other editorial reviews that are also a part of the book cover there. Um, for example, it talks about John Maxwell, uh, excuse me, Paul Maxwell has contributed to an interesting awaiting study on a growing literature on trauma and religion. His discussion concerns the wounding, debilitating damage that can be done by church doctrine. Um, he says his particular target is the new Calvinism, a highly scholastic form of theology and the toxic force of syll uh, syllogistic doctrines claims that inherently abusive intellectually and emotionally. His study can as well aptly, uh, and he goes on, uh, I mean, this this goes on for a long time, and I'm trying to skip through. Well, that's why I highlighted the portions I wanted to highlight. I don't want to read all these to you, but um, this other one from Kevin Van Hooser down from the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School says, he, Paul, takes the, takes the road less traveled towards spiritual recovery retrieving properly reformed resources to deal with a problem generated by reformed theology itself. And as Maxwell says, has written a reflection like no other on the awful sovereign grace of God. 
Now, again, we, we've heard uh, John Calvin call it dreadful, the dreadful decree. Here we hear Maxwell calling the sovereign grace of God awful. Um, and this is one of the things we've pushed back on because we don't believe that sovereign grace should be seen as awful. It's good news, not bad news. And the fact that Calvinism has such an impact on so many people with regard to seeing the awfulness of it, and of course the word awful can be in a sense of all filling and not necessarily seen in a, in a, in a most negative light. And, and so we could, we could assume that when he says awful here, he's not meaning it in the most negative light, but given the content of the work, he is highlighting the quote unquote negative awful impact that the certain claim, the, the specific claims of Calvinistic doctrine can have on people. And so I, I want you to hear from Dr. Maxwell yourself. The, the, the thing that sparked all of this was from, uh, I think his TikTok page or one of the page, I can't, I don't know, Twitter, or one of the social media pages. I'm not sure which one it is, uh, Instagram, maybe. Um, I want you to hear him in his emotional state. Um, he has shaved his beard in this particular broadcast. And so he doesn't, it's not quite as recognizable as he normally is. Cause he usually, before he had this just big old long Calvinist beard. And, uh, apparently whenever, uh, you leave uh, Christianity and Calvinism, you get rid of the beard too. I don't know. You're not allowed to wear it anymore. I'm not sure what the rules are on that. I don't mean to make light of this, but, um, you'll see, you'll see what I mean. This is a very emotional, uh, heart wrenching, uh, uh, you know, testimony. And again, uh, just being completely transparent uh, with what he's dealing with and what he's going through. And I want you to, to watch it for yourself. L let me know sound wise, if this is coming through. Okay. If you don't mind. My parents would take me here every day when I was a kid. And uh, I really miss it here. But it, it reminds me most that what I really miss is connection with people. And I think the internet has done a lot, a lot of damage to that. But what I've discovered is that I'm ready to connect again. And I'm kind of ready not to be angry anymore. I love you guys. And I love all the support and friendships I've built here. And um, I think I think it's important to say that I'm just not I'm just not a Christian anymore. And it feels really good. And I'm really happy. I'm really happy. And I can't wait to discover what kind of connection I can have with all of you beautiful people as I try to figure out what's next. I love you guys. I'm in a really good spot. Probably the best, best spot of my life. And I'm so full of joy for the first time. I love my life for the first time. I love myself for the first time. And I hope I can share that. I hope I can share that with you. Ended up finishing that. Yeah. And this next section we're going to play is a, a podcast that you'll, I'll, I'll bring that back up in a minute. But, um, it's heart wrenching to hear that it, it, whether this guy was formerly a provisionist, a Calvinist, it, it guys, beyond that, it is heart wrenching when you see someone who is obviously hurting. He says he's happy, but it's almost like he's trying to convince himself he's happy. At least I don't know, Paul, and maybe that's the way he expresses himself. Maybe it really truly is um, happy. But he, but notice one of the things he said there, and I can relate to this, having been a Calvinist for ten years. He said, I, "I'm not angry anymore. I don't have to be angry anymore." There's something. There's something about that. Um, and again, this is not all Calvinists. Don't don't hear, please don't hear this as an accusation against all Calvinists. Some Calvinists have different reactions to different doctrines and their own journey. And I'm not trying to project this on all Calvinists. Um, but for me, when when I came into Calvinism <clears throat> and my <clears throat> excuse me, my journey while a Calvinist, all through my twenties, looks like, but his age, I I don't know how much older 
he is or younger than he, uh, and, uh, he looks like he's in his mid thirties or something. I'm not sure how old uh, Paul Maxwell is, but he definitely looks younger than I am. Um, and I just remember in my twenties, when I was a Calvinist, um, you, you don't recognize that you're, you have this built up, but there's, 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 you're on a defense mechanism all the time because there's so many people who don't like you for being a Calvinist and you feel like you're trying to defend it all the time because you're just, you feel like you're being attacked all the time because of what you believe, but you just know it's biblical. I mean, look at Romans nine. It's so obvious. And how do you people not see it? And so you're just, it's like you're, you're, you're trying to defend this thing that you love so much all the time. And it kind of builds in this, within it, this inherent, this inherent anger towards the church as a whole. And oftentimes distances you from people who disagree with you. Uh, I went through that. Y'all remember my, my mom and dad are not Calvinistic and my church split over the subject. And I was part of the, part of the church that split off as a Calvinist branch of that church. And it cut off a lot of those relationships because I was defending what I saw as the, 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 the truth of God's word. And it split up a lot of, a lot of relationships And it. There was some anger that was built into some of what I, what I felt was righteous anger, of course, because I was defending the truth of God's word as I understood it. And, and when you're in that Calvinistic mode, you can become that kind of negative and mean and a little bit angry about things. And sometimes that, that happens. Um, and so, there, there, there are, uh, there are records of this. We talked about this before. Um, when John Piper was asked the question, why are Calvinists so negative? And he does a podcast on this. And he says, I, I love the doctrines of grace with all my heart, John Piper speaking. And I, and I think they're pride shattering, humbling and, and love producing doctrines. But I think there's an attractiveness about them to some people in large matter because of their intellectual rigor. They are powerfully coherent doctrines, and certain kinds of minds are drawn to that. And those kinds of minds tend to be argumentative. So the intellectual appeal of the system of Calvinism draws a certain kind of intellectual person, and that type of person doesn't tend to be the most warm and fuzzy and tender. Therefore, this type of person has a greater danger of becoming hostile, gruff, abrupt, and sensitive, intellectualistic, and I would add angry, you know, as, as Paul just reflected on there. And he says, I just confess that it's a sad and terrible thing that that's the case. Some of this, some of this type aren't even Christians. I think you can embrace a system of theology and not even be born again. Um, and, and he goes on, he says, another reason for Calvinists to be seen negative is when a person comes to see the doctrines of grace in the Bible, he's often amazed that he missed it. And sometimes he can become angry. Uh, he can become angry that he grew up in a church or a home where he never talked about it. And was really, um, you know, it feels like it was skipped over and he was misled for so long. And I, and I went through that. I remember feeling that. So what John Piper is addressing, this was years ago that he, he did this broadcast, probably eight or 10 years ago. So he's not even addressing Paul or his testimony here. It's just, this really, this came to my mind when I heard Paul's testimony, because I related to that because when you're a Calvinist, sometimes you don't even recognize it. You can become so defensive and you can actually become angry with the Christian world in a sense, because they just don't get it. They don't, they don't understand. And that's why you hear Calvinists so oftentimes when they get on the defensive, you just don't get it. You just don't understand. And they get angry and they get mean and they get emotional about it. And, and, and I did too. Um, and the reverse can happen too, by the way, uh, you can get pretty angry at Calvinist, uh, as a non-Calvinist, as you know. And so, I, I think that part of what he's leaving behind or what he feels freedom from is the the religiosity of the Reformed tradition and the anger that maybe that produced within his own life. I, I don't, again, I don't know his parents. I don't know. He's, he's reflecting on where he used to grow up and being there in that beautiful place, part of nature. And he's obviously emotional about that. Um, but, but that, that freeing aspect though I didn't leave the Christian faith altogether, I remember that freeing feeling of, oh, I don't have to be angry anymore. <laughs> you know, there was this kind of like this, this, and we, and some of the testimonies we've had of former Calvinists who've come on the program, talk about that, how they, they felt like this, this, this relief of, oh, I don't have to defend God and his sovereign control over everything all the time anymore. And, and they, and they felt like they were finally released from that to a degree. Um, and, and so I think there's some of that that you see here in Paul's words um, that that may reflect on uh, less about leaving Christianity, but more about leaving the Calvinistic aspects of Christianity. And and of course, to him, that's all one and the same because he is related 
Christianity as a whole with his form of Christianity, which would be Calvinistic. Um, Dustin, thank you for super chat. He says, show me one example of a non-Calvinist who left the faith and said that he loved not being a Christian anymore because God wanted to save all people. Yeah, it, you, Dustin, you make a good point. I, I, <coughs> excuse me. Calvinists who leave Christianity do tend to reflect on their Calvinism as parts of the reasons, like we've played with Derek Webb, like we played with um, Megan Phelps, who, who quotes from Romans 9 and says this is just evil. And of course, she had interpreted Romans 9 like she was taught to interpret it from the Calvinist vantage point. And, um, and a lot of the people, at least the well-known people who are leaving the Christian faith, often cite things that are uniquely Calvinistic for their reasons for leaving the Christian faith. You, you don't hear non-Calvinists leaving the Christian faith and citing a uniquely provisionistic doctrine as their reasons for it. Um, that that's probably true and, and, and point well made. And maybe I'm being a little too conciliatory on that particular point. I don't, don't mean to be, but at the same time, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to walk the ground here to, to help people to understand that it's bad argumentation to suggest that just because someone's a Calvinist, it's necessarily going to lead them to become an atheist. Um, or because someone's a provisionist, they could never leave the faith in the sense of leaving behind um, or, or walking away from uh, Christianity or on, on that journey of Christianity um, that they maybe get. And so anyway, there, there's a, a ton of different topics that we could go down here and we're going to be here forever if I don't get <laughs> get to this podcast. But um, th this particular broadcast, it's it's called Heaven and Earth and it's by a, a, a man named Wyatt, uh, Wyatt Graham, who is interviewing um, Paul Maxwell on this particular broadcast. And it's an interesting conversation. The both of them are PhDs. Both of them are obviously very smart as you will hear in the, in the broadcast. And, um, and I just want you to listen to the discussion. I, I don't play it in its entirety. It, the, the link is in the show notes. You can go listen to it in its entirety, but I just clipped out some portions here that I think are very telling because this was eight months ago. This was when Paul was still professing faith. He was just produced his book, his dissertation, uh, was promoting that book, um, and, um, was, you know, employed apparently by Desiring God and others as an author. And so, um, he's very much a Christian when he's doing this broadcast, but you can see some hints and some things spe specifically with regard to his reformed theology. And you can almost hear under the words of some of the things he's saying, some of the, the doubts even creeping in about understanding God is good and, and believing in God is good, given his reformed doctrinal beliefs. And so with that, let's just listen to this broadcast and, and uh, I, I may stop and interject some, I'm going to try to play long portions of it. Otherwise we'll be here forever. But there was so much of it that I, I kept going, Oh, this would be too long if I left this in here. But then I was, Oh man, I got to leave this in here. There was so much of it that was so good that I want you to hear. Um, and so it, it's pretty long, but Let's engage with it, and I, I think it'll teach us a lot as we as we learn from this this particular man's own spiritual journey. 2018, and that's going to be the book. <laughs> it's a, it's a play on uh, Kevin Van Hooser's book, The Drama of Doctrine. My dissertation is going to be published by Fortress Press in 2020. It's called The Trauma of Doctrine, hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and it, yeah, it's uh, it's it's it retrieves reformed categories, but also highlights some of the ways that reformed concepts are irrevocably problematic for the experience of trauma by a believer, and uh, tries not to shy away from what the empirical evidence gives us about just some of the habits and patterns of the ways reformed communities supply pastoral care in our cultural context and how that can inhibit things. But more significantly than that, the ways that maximalist conceptions of divine control and human moral corruption can kind of get in the way of traumatic recovery for people sometimes. And uh, you can, you, you could do that kind of analysis with any theology. It's not to say reformed theology is the bad for trauma, you know, people who are traumatized, but merely to say you could look at any theology and just kind of be open to the ways that those concepts, even rightly understood, can become obstacles to necessary recovery for uh, right. people who have experienced a traumatic event. So I thought that it was appropriate for me to do it because when I was writing it, I considered myself as someone coming from a reform perspective. So I thought 
I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have the problem of being somebody who's looking to get a jab in at reform theology. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, uh, I was willing to take a critical look at my own tradition and say, you know, what are we really saying here? Because a lot of times when you have sort of a hagiographical approach to your own tradition, you end up missing a lot of the depth that's there because you're shying away from contradiction. Uh, with Sorry, my, my mic was muted. Sorry about that. Um, the hagiographical uh, that he's referring to is just a big word for overly flattering. So when you have an overly flattering presentation of your particular doctrine, you can't be honest with the uh, apparent contradictions within it. And so this, again, this is, speaks to, to Dr. Maxwell's honesty. Um, he, he, is, he is not trying to hide the, what he sees as the inherent flaws of his own tradition. And, and that, that I think can be valuable because these are things, things that he's pointing out in his book um, that I was unaware of before his exit of Christianity and this whole thing coming out in the news. I didn't realize he had even written this because it would have been uh, great material for me to go through because he's saying he's come to a lot of the same conclusions that I've come to about the Reformed tradition. And one of the reasons I left Reformed tradition is probably a lot of the same reason why he left Christianity altogether. I just wish he wouldn't have gone so far as to leave Christianity altogether. I wish he'd have followed his boss's lead and say, hey, I would rather you be an Armenian Christian than to leave Christianity altogether. Um, but unfortunately, he's, he, at least now, at least now in his journey, he's renounced Christianity, and that, that's uh, terribly unfortunate. But uh, listen to what he goes on to say. In the Christian view, I mean, that, you know, to get not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but, you know, Cornelius Van Til, one of his famous lines is that, the Christian is in praise of perceive, uh, of apparent contradiction, but of uh, but abhors real real contradiction, of course. But but of course, for us, all there is is perceived contradiction. All there is is apparent contradiction. You know, um, and so for us, we just have to find those and call them mystery, which is a beautiful thing, which we should embrace. And so I just hadn't seen a lot of that in our theological methodology in evangelical circles. Um, not that there's not a category for mystery or that there's some kind of hyper-rationalism. I don't think there is, but I just didn't really see mystery playing a, you know, a big part on the stage of evangelical thought. And I thought, well, if we're willing to embrace it, then we're, look, we're, then we're willing to look plainly at exactly what's there. And that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I felt hadn't been done by evangelicals about the reform tradition and also about some of the harsh realities of trauma, because a lot of times we want to, because of our theological anthropology put things in a very strictly defined categorical definition of exactly how human beings work from a top-down perspective but you've got all this bottom-up data from the biggest discipline in the world which is psychology mm -hmm. and to just say well i don't know you know like <laughs> just not listen to it that's um i mean you can do it but there are consequences to that that you won't be able to understand and when people look at you and say you don't get it, you've got to admit, yes, I mean, if I'm not willing to read the literature, it's very possible there's something I don't understand. So I just wanted to be the person who understood. And that's all I ever wanted to do with theological education. It's the only reason I've ever paid a single dollar for tuition is because I had questions and I wanted to answer those questions. I never aspired to be a church leader. I never aspired to be a pastor. I never aspired to be a thought leader. I never wanted to play any kind of leadership role in the church or parachurch organization. I just wanted to know and experience God as he is. And that's what I've gotten out of it so far for good or ill. <laughs> I'd be interested for you to kind of maybe open up a little bit about that. Like maybe you could kind of summarize your book or just kind of off the cuff explain what sort of reform categories do you find to be troublesome or unhelpful in the discussion, you know, when it comes to the discussion of trauma? Yeah, well, that's, a very, that's a very good question. So uh, I, I wasn't prepared to summarize it, but I mean, I think... Or just pick any, one that's interesting to you. No, no, no. But, I, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm eager to answer your questions. So, so let me just sort of frame my approach to relating trauma to reform theology, because I don't think of it, first of all, as an integrative task, because that assumes that the two are categorically comparable in some way, right? And I don't think they are as closely you know, categorically related as we might think. So I think before we even talk about integration, we have to talk first about understanding and conception. And so that, so, so when it gets, when it comes to look, evaluating the import of reformed ideas 
just and not just reformed ideas, right? Because if you talk to a reformed a reform person, they think every idea is a reformed idea, but distinctively reformed ideas, you know, um, like maximalist conceptions of divine control um, and and maximalist conceptions of human moral corruption. So, okay, so uh, the, he, like I said, he's very heady, very intellectualistic, and so some of this uh, I've listened to it a couple times, so I've been able to digest it. But for those that are listening, he he is specifically addressing unique claims of reform slash Calvinistic doctrine. And he's re referencing to the maximal superlatives like God's maximal control, his quote unquote sovereignty as defined as meticulous divine providence, i.e. determinism. And so th that's what he's addressing. And he's addressing how those particular views can impact those who have experienced trauma in their life, like a rape victim or someone who's had you know, a child taken from them or horrible uh, trauma in life. Um, the claims of the Calvinistic system, uniquely of the Calvinistic system, and the impact that it has on trauma victims uh, and their their process of healing. And so ultimately his conclusion is that um, empirically the facts show for all practical purposes that that many times those who have gone through trauma are actually harmed, not helped, by the specific claims of the Calvinistic doctrine. Now he'll go on to explain, or if he hasn't explained already, that doesn't make one right or wrong. It doesn't make it true or false based upon this practical implication in any individual person's life. But he as a psychologist or person who's trying to help somebody get through trauma as a pastoral person, then if, if the claims, the truth claims of my system aren't conducive for healing for those who are going through trauma, then something has to give. And either I have to give up what I consider to be true, or I have to lie to these people, <laughs> tell them something that's not true in order to comfort them in their time of loss or their time of grief. And that's the problem here. Um, so hopefully you're you're hearing his, his the kind of quandary that he's coming through here and the apparent inconsistencies, uh, the, i.e. the mysteries of this concept of, you know, true res human responsibility and divine, quote unquote, divine sovereignty, meaning determinism. The problem, first of all, in understanding these ideas rightly is that there's a lot of ego uh, produced by anxiety around the theodicy dilemma as it stands for the Reformed community because the Reformed community faces an entirely different enterprise as it relates to the problem of evil than does, for example, a community that doesn't believe in a maximalist sense of divine control. And there are appeals made to Calvin as though he had solved this problem internally in his system or, or, or others, right, who say, well, there's a difference between God's decorative will and his permissive will and uh, all these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, the Calvinists believe that God looked at the potential rape of a little girl and said, yep, that's happening. That's happening by my will. Right. And that's a problem. And then Calvinists shy away from that. And the fact is that's that's a deep problem and that every single person who's traumatized has to look at all of the heinous evil they've experienced in life and say, God said yes to this. Not just yes, but uh, not, not only that he couldn't have prevented it, but this was according to his will, which really puts you in a state of cognitive dissonance as it relates to God, because then if all I can trust him for is my salvation and everything else is just left up for grabs, then what are we even doing here? Right. And so these are just some of the psychological tensions that reformed theology can tease out in a person. Now, I want to be really careful because I. Okay, so, uh, so hopefully you're hearing what he's talking about, how he's talking about the unique claims of the Reformed tradition um, and and how those claims with regard to rape and these horrible, the, the worst kinds of things that we can imagine that can happen to people that cause trauma, that ultimately it didn't just happen that God permitted it to happen, as would be in the other uh, traditions of Christianity, that God didn't stop it, which has its own issues. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pretend like there's not issues with that. That's the problem of evil, theodicy. Why does God allow for things evil to happen? Why does he step in and stop evil? Which there are answers to that. But that's a big, much bigger question than why would God causally determine it, bring it to pass for his own self-glorification? That's a bigger issue. And that's what Paul, at least he's being honest enough to really answer that point, to really say, um, I, I'm not going to ignore this. I'm, I'm not going to uh, skirt this. I'm not going to try to get away from this. I'm going to address it head on. And, and so again, 
Uh, I commend him for his honesty. Uh, Jason, thank you for your super chat. Appreciate that. I don't believe the Calvinist doctrine. Well, uh, and by the Calvinist doctrine, I mean Calvin's doctrine of divine control, which is actually stronger than a lot of modern reformed conceptions of uh, divine control and sovereignty. But the, the Calvin's own conception of divine control, I don't think there's anything wrong with the, the idea per se, nor his conception of human moral corruption. And I don't think, and, and I say this as much because such a statement would be absurd to say this idea is traumatizing, right? Or this idea is problematic, or this idea can't be true because it's so horrible. You know, we, we, all, we all hear those kinds of arguments and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the reform community, to our credit, is really sensitive to the epistemological issues around these things. So what I don't want to do, and I, what I really try to distinguish myself from methodologically, is an existentially argued theology, right? I'm not really interested in that at all. Whatever's the truth, that's what I want to know. It's the, if it's the most, if we live in the most horrendous world, it, you know, conceivable, I at least want to know that we do. And so Okay. So you, hopefully you hear what he's saying. He's trying to say that even if Calvinism's unique claims lead to horrendously bad results in the healing of people going through trauma, I'm not going to abandon truth because of this practical implication. I'm going to be honest here. Um, and so, um, again, he, he's, he's showing that in his studies and what he was going through, there's obviously a tension between the claims of what he believes is true and how it practically plays itself out in the lives of actual individuals. The two don't seem to be meshing very well, um, but he's committed to stick with truth if that's what he finds to be true, which is one of the reasons I think that one could abandon the faith altogether if that tension becomes so strong and the anger builds up and trying to defend this tension, it's sometimes it's easier just to get rid of the tension by dropping what you think is true, uh, which seems to be what has happened with uh, Paul, at least. Um, Master Sanders, thank you for your super chat. He says, given the wave of apostasy we're seeing, do you think we may have hit the peak of the new Calvinist wave? I think more and more people are going to begin to be more introspective within the new Calvinist movement. I think more and more, especially as they come of age, um, you, you see this even take place in this conversation. I don't know that we'll get to that part of the conversation, but this conversation between uh, Wyatt and Paul, uh, they, they talk about how uh, Calvin was very young uh, when he wrote the Institutes, and they and they wonder if he would have lived to be in his 40s and 50s if he would have not softened some of the, the points that he ended up uh, holding to uh, with regard to some of these ideas of sovereignty. And, um, and, and so as the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings become older, I think you're going to see more of them become more introspective and a little bit more uh, critical uh, and less dogmatic of their own worldview. And and I think you will begin to see, as we've seen historically, uh, Calvinism begin to die back out. But I, I could be wrong on that, but we'll, we'll, we shall see, uh, as they say. So so, um, so what I what I do, first of all, is I, I have to distinguish myself from people who reject the Calvinist conception of God simply because they don't like it, which is what many, you know, many critiques of Reformed theology do come down to that. It's a, it's a heart appeal, right? And I'm not... Okay, so this is what we hear oftentimes is the only reason you're rejecting Calvinism is for emotive reasons. It's too... It, emotionally, you just can't, you just can't swallow the difficult pill of God sovereignly and unchangeably ordaining the rape of children for his own glorification. That's why you're rejecting it. Now, uh, many of you know, that's not the reason I rejected Reformed theology or Calvinistic theology. Um, I'm, I'm not a really touchy-feely type of individual when it comes to those kinds of things, and emotion, don't dri emo emotion doesn't typically drive my particular study. So I know that's not true of me. Um, I, I came out of Calvinism for doctrinal reasons because I don't believe that Romans, I was led to believe Romans 9 was not uh, an apologetic for uh, Calvinistic concept of reprobation. I was led to understand Ephesians 1 uh, differently than I had been taught it from the Reformed tradition. And that's why I left Calvinism, because it was a pill I was willing to swallow when I thought the Bible taught it. It was a pill I was gladly ready to choke back up when I saw that the, the scriptures did not support it or teach it. And so um, my rejection of Reformed theology does not is not for emotive reasons. Is that to suggest that nobody rejects Calvinism because of emotional reasons? Of course not. There are a lot of people who very likely do reject Calvinism, not because of anything the scriptures say, per se, but because of their emotional abhorrence to the claims of the system. Uh, and just the, maybe even the intuitive um, you know, re rejection of it based upon its actual claims. Todd, thank you for your super chat. Appreciate that. 
And uh, and Jason, thank you for yours as well. He says, Dr. Flowers, do you consider the, the Shroud of Turon to be scientific proof of the gospel message? Um, not really not really on the, the topic that we're talking about today, and I, I don't really have an opinion on the Shroud. I don't know much, much about it, unfortunately. I'm not interested in heart appeals. I am interested in the heart, but I'm interested, first of all, in understanding the truth. So, so when I approach Reformed theology and try to be honest about the ways that it can be disruptive to traumatic healing, um, I, the strongest we can put it, I think, is to say that reformed ideas, uh, distinctively reformed ideas, mainly being maximalist conceptions of divine control and human moral corruption, they can, um, they can incline traumatized individuals to be more psychologically likely to negatively internalize those concepts in their mind rather than to positively internalize them. So what we really want to avoid is any kind of universal claim about how a certain theological idea relates to human psychology, which we absolutely cannot do. But if we say that on the negative side of things, right, that we can't, to, to make a claim such as, you know, a Calvinist conception of divine control is psychologically unhealthy, that's not true. That's on its face. It isn't true, right? I mean, that that that's your. I mean, we have empirical data that shows otherwise. We have, uh, you know, we have n equals one data that tells us otherwise, right? We have every single person who has a positive experience psychologically of the Calvinist conception of divine control is proof otherwise, right? So we can't make any such ridiculous claim. Likewise, can't we make any a claim in the other direction, which is actually closer to my point, that well, the Calvinist doctrine of divine control is psychologically healthy for everybody to believe. Now, this doesn't get down to the fact or the matter of whether it's the truth or not, right? Because I'm not, I'm not concerned, first of all, whether that Calvinist doctrine is true or not. I mean, personally, I'm concerned with it, but materially in my dissertation, I'm concerned with how does it interface with human psychology and how can we retrieve other reformed concepts that are, um, that are closer to the traumatic wound itself, to the traumatic wound site itself, to give us a little bit more ability, uh, rather a little bit more ability, uh, <laughs> more mobility rather for the traumatized person to be able to make autonomous theological decisions for their own sake on their own behalf, on the basis of their own critical thinking, right? And so um, we see this all throughout scripture, right? Uh, of, of people being horrified by the truth people being horrified by the truth of God and the truth of his interaction with the world and finding him to be wanting. Um, and we see that we see those anxieties faithful, faithfully expressed by David in the Psalms. I'm sure they were faithfully expressed by Paul in the prison cell, you know, uh, well, yes, we're sorrowful and we're always rejoicing, but psychologically speaking, we know that's not true because we don't even know what that means on a psychological level. What does it mean to be always this thing or always that thing? Right. In principle, we know that we want to be dis we, we strive to be dispositionally these things, but none of us are ever always any one thing or another thing. Right. So I love the way that Paul sets up the ideal, but then also I think we have to assume Paul's operating with a much more sober sense of, how human beings really work. So when it comes to how the reformed uh, doctrines relate to trauma, uh, I, I, I won't go so much into the details of my argument because um, I think that could really uh, consume a lot of our time needlessly perhaps. But I will say that my basic thesis is that maximalist conceptions of divine control and human moral corruption, which are a faithful reading of John Calvin, produce a uniquely problematic uh, issue for reformed theology as it relates to the problem of evil that can't be erased away by saying, oh, well, you don't really understand the problem of evil. Oh, well, you don't really understand the Calvinist doctrine of sovereignty. Oh, you don't really understand the Calvinist doctrine of, of, of human depravity. No, I do. I do. And it's still problematic. Uh, okay. So <laughs> how many times do you hear people saying, you just don't understand Calvinism? Uh, this is one of the leading authors with a PhD who knows and understands Calvinism is acknowledging the exact same thing that we've said dozens of times on this program while being accused by Calvinists of not understanding Calvinism. And to hear Dr. Maxwell, um, a Calvinist at this time, at least explaining that, yes, there are unique practical implications and problems of holding to this concept of the maximal uh, control of God uh, within our universe on those who've experienced trauma the 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 rubber doesn't meet the road here too well when it comes to applying these reformed doctrines and so what are we going to do about that um and he's acknowledging that and he's saying you can't just say well you just don't understand calvinism because if you understand true 
John Calvin's teaching on this subject, um, this is what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with what John Calvin actually taught on this subject and how it applies to the real world situations of trauma. Again, not problematic conceptually, problematic psychologically. And I go into empirical evidence uh, to explain why, and I uh, unveil the psychological research in that regard. But what I want to do is say, and try to essentially plot how it relates to all of those things through modern legal culpability theory to say, how can we make sense of the goodness of God without losing such semantic connection to whatever it means that God is good, that we all ultimately end up saying, right. well, he's good in some way that we could never understand. Because if that's true, then when we say that God is good, we're truly saying something we don't understand, right? Now we're in the realm of Meister Eckhart. Now we're beyond Thomas Aquinas, we're beyond Duns Scotus, or mystics at that point. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to rescue reformed theodicy from mysticism, which in its current form, it is. It's an Eckhartian mysticism. And Okay, so uh, you're following what he's talking about here. Again, these are things that I've said in my own more simplistic layman way of saying it, because I'm not the academic that he is, uh, the intellect that he has, apparently. Um, because I had to listen to him two or three times in slow-mo to understand everything he's talking about and look up words as he went along. So I know I'm not on the level academic that he is, but he's saying a lot of the same things that we've said here in, in argument against Calvinism. Um, and for, for example, we, we've used C.S. Lewis to say the exact same thing that what you just heard him say. Um, and you can see it there on the screen. Uh, where where C.S. Lewis said this. On the other hand, if God's moral judgments differ from ours so that our black may be his white, we can mean nothing by calling him good. For to say God is good while asserting that his goodness is wholly other than ours is really only to say God is we know not what. And an un, utterly unknown quality in God cannot give us moral grounds for loving or obeying him. If he is not in our sense good, we shall obey, if at all, only through fear and should be equally ready to obey an omnipotent fiend or an all-powerful demon is what that word means. The doctrine of total depravity, when the consequence is drawn that, since we are totally depraved, our idea of good is worth simply nothing. This may turn Christianity into a form of devil worship. This is exactly what uh, Warren McGrew and I were talking about on a recent program, where we're talking about if total depravity, as defined by John Calvin and Calvinists that understand what they're talking about, as total inability, that there's this moral inability to understand truth, divine truth from God, then we can say we we worship no we we know not what because we don't have the faculties the capacities by our nature to understand right from wrong good from evil intuitively or otherwise because our nature is so corrupt such that we can't have a known quality by which to call God good by any measure of what is good this is exactly the point that Dr Maxwell is pointing out here in this particular discussion which is helpful because it, I think it really does lend itself to understand why someone would abandon not just Christianity in general, but Calvinism in specific. Continuing on. And so, and so I'm trying to rescue from it, uh, rescue it, not in the Gordon Clark, Duns Scotus, and, you know, hierarchy chain of being way where when I, I'll, if I say God is good, it has to mean exactly what I think the word good means, right? Which is that rationalist perspective. I, we have to respect the doctrine of analogy, but the doctrine of analogy insists on some semantic continuity, right? And so to the degree that there's semantic continuity between my word good and the attribute of God, which is goodness, mm -hmm. their legal culpability theory is relevant because it's the most common sense, straightforward, direct way of measuring moral responsibility. I, I, the final point that I make, actually, because I am a Ventilian, I consider myself a Ventilian, is that we needed to recover a Christian notion of autonomy. We don't like that word. Even my advisor, Kevin Van Hooser, was like, self-law, really? And it's like, okay, that's first of all, that's the etymological fallacy. Second of all, <laughs> uh, we, we, we can say that we can recover autonomy without meaning metaphysical autonomy in the sense that Van Til rejects it, right? When I say autonomy, I'm talking about when I'm at work and I, I'm, I'm leading a project at work and I ask my boss, hey, can I have a little bit more autonomy on this project? Uh, would he be right to respond to me? Human beings don't have autonomy. We've known this since postmodernism. It, it's, no, he knows what I mean. And the average person knows what I mean when I say autonomy, right? Self-governance, what Aristotle calls autocracy, right? It's the ability to self-govern according to your own principles is that you Okay, so the reason I had to put that in there was because you remember that we had the back and forth 
between James White and I and other Calvinist and I when I'm defending the autonomy of m m humanity. And I'm defending it in the same sense that he is, in the sense of not saying that we exist autonomously from God as, as if we don't have the ability to breathe that uh, we, have, we have the ability to breathe and exist apart from God, but that we have certain abilities to self-govern autonomously from God, and that there has to be a recognition of some sense of autonomy in order for us to have any sense of true human responsibility and not fall into, I think, the fatalistic trap that some Calvinists, especially in the New Calvinist movement, have fallen into with regard to the quote-unquote maximally deterministic quote-unquote sovereignty of God as being the author and approver ultimately of all things, if the claims of their systematic are true. And so um, the fact that he's pointing this out, I think, was just, in, again, he's, he's self-reflecting on a view that he currently says he holds to. Now, we know now that he's abandoned the, the, his views on Calvinism as well as Christianity altogether now. But while he's making these arguments, he's actually reflecting upon what he sees as a problem within uh, the Reformed tradition itself. You are an individually self-governed person. It's what Jocko Willink means, right, when he talks about discipline. It's about having rule over yourself, which does not compete and is not competitive with uh, God's rule over us. And the fact that we equivocate those terms is a huge hindrance to mm. psychology and to the Christian ability to learn from psychology in a way that actually enriches all of the benefits we receive in our progressive sanctification through Christ. So I think it's an irreplaceable word. No. And, and so when you were talking about earlier, some of the maximal versions of God's control, mm -hmm. that would imply a sort of diminished role for kind of an individual's ability to self-master themselves. Because if it's all, I know this is the bad word to use, but if it all feels like fate, I know it's not in the Calvinist no, sure. for sure, but if it sure. feels that way to you as a person, right? then you may, especially if you're, if you're predisposed or if you had trauma in your life or if you're in a place that you're not thinking properly, Right. You may be predisposed to think, okay, well, I'm going to let totally let go. It's right. all under the auspices of fate, even if that fate seems evil and unjust. You know, whatever God ordains is right. Right. Um, I, it, and yet, that's not that's not that's not what the reformers were saying. I don't think <laughs> at all. No, no. Nor what the they, doctrine they trying not to means. say that for sure. Yeah. But some, I can see how people could get there to this kind of despair because of the you know fate ravishes you essentially. Yeah. And now, Wyatt, in the question, do you, I, hopefully you're hearing the point that he's trying to bring out, is that though reformers don't want to teach fatalism, there inevitably are going to be some people who take it fatalistically and apply it fatalistically. And of course, why do they do that? If Calvinism is true, they do that because God is determined for them to do that, ironically enough. And, and if they don't do that, if they do what they're supposed to do, according to the Calvinists, it's because God has determined for them to do what they're supposed to do. And therefore, you've got this circular reasoning from the very get-go as to why people are practically not able to deal with trauma when they are ultimately putting God as the one who faded the trauma that they've gone through. Faded meaning, by definition, that God is the one who fixed it in eternity past and that it could not have been otherwise. And not only did he fix it, but he fixed it in accordance with with his own self-glorification for his own purposes. Um, and he he's the one who brought it to pass for his good. So this evil, heinous thing that you had traumatized your life was actually a part of your creator, God's self-glorifying plan and purpose. And, and so how that affects people psychologically is the subject of this paper. And the criticism, I think, that Dr. Maxwell is bringing to the Reformed tradition and how the Reformed tradition should deal with these issues uh, on a practical level. And so that is a, certainly a component of it. Um, the other component of it is just really the pressing problem of, I, I actually try to, I haven't seen this really come up. I actually think I did encounter it in one book, but but I came up with this concept of, we have the logical problem of evil and the, and the evidential problem of evil, and there are many ways of slicing that pie but we never really talk about the existential problem of evil because we don't know how to understand it. Because with evidence, you've got the scientific, you know, rules of scientific uh, reasoning. And then with the rational problem, you've simply got the laws of logic. But then uh, with the existential problem of evil, there's not necessarily laws there that help you understand whether it's a legitimate grievance or not. And so I think the problem that people are left with, and <laughs> there, I have a, an excursus about how Calvin really had to chill out throughout his ministry because he was pounding the table on divine sovereignty and everybody was leaving his church 
you know, he was still becoming popular, but, but he was losing a lot of friendships and you actually see this in his letters, uh, volumes two and four. And, um, Oh, I forget. I, I'm not recalling all their, all their names right now, but, but, um, you know, he was telling people like their kids were dying, their wives were dying. He's like, remember God did that. God did that. God did that. And he never stopped believing that, but, but eventually he started writing people and he was like, you know, who would go through tragedy, uh, uh, specifically after he lost his own child um, and, and, his, and his wife who did not believe that he was a good husband. And I say that as a huge Calvin fan and also as probably not a good husband, right? <laughs> like I'm not judging Calvin, right? We're, we're, all, we're all humans, we all are feet of clay. But, but um, you know, uh, but eventually in Calvin's pastoral letters, he begins telling people who are going through trouble or, or who are grieving the loss of a child or something like that. He would say, hey, why don't you come to um, our town and just relax. And I made all the people at church promise not to talk to you. And then they'd write back like the next day, be like on my way, you know, and he started being able to rebuild his friendships again because he started to understand grief. You know, he started to understand that it wasn't all so simple. And sure. Now it, Paul's not saying this, but I am. What ultimately Calvin came to recognize is that Calvinism isn't very practical. So I better not start with Calvinism when I'm dealing with people who've lost loved ones people who are traumatized, I better not teach them truth, i.e. Calvinism, because it's not very helpful. It just distances my relationships with people. It just, it, it drives them away. It doesn't work. And so he changes his methodology, though he continues to believe like a Calvinist. This is why you'll hear a lot of times Calvinists talk about how you believe like a Calvinist, but act like things really matter. You, people, people even say in grief things, well, you don't, you don't need to talk about sovereignty and all those kinds of things. That's not what they need whenever they're going through trauma and these kinds of things. Well, People need truth. Um, people do need truth. The thing is, is truth when it's right is practical and it works in my estimation. And in my experience, truth heals because truth actually is practical. Truth actually works. It's one of the good measures in my estimation of what is true and what is false. If, if you're trying to balance between, if you've got scripture and you're trying, you're, you're debating on which, which interpretation is the right one. And there's good theological sound arguments from well-intending spirit-filled people who have studied these things for years and you're trying to find out which of these two interpretations is more likely the right one, the one that practically works is probably the right one. Why? Because God's a very practical God. <laughs> He's, he, he actually provides solutions and truth that works for healing people. And I find that provisionistic doctrine, when applied to people going through trauma, actually works better than that of the Reformed tradition. That doesn't make Calvinism wrong and us right. It simply is an argument in favor for the practicality of provisionism as in contrast with the claims of Calvinistic doctrine. As he thought it was when he was 30, which is why I wish Calvin hadn't died so young, because we always like to think of these guys as having this coherent theology, right? What did Calvin believe? What did Thomas believe? These were, these were human organisms in process. And I would have loved to have read Calvin's 15th edition of his institutes that he released at age 80, yeah. you know, because he I wrote, think it would have a lot different. He wrote his first edition at, at 27, I think. Yes, that's right. And, at, at 15, uh, something, something. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not, he's brilliant, but no, he is, he's yes. also 27 and uh, really? you change. In fact, I, I've seen the argument that he. So truth changes when you get older or your application of it changes when you get older. I mean, w which is it? I mean, that, that's, that's, the, that's the whole point of this is you don't just change the application by hiding the truth or skirting it. You actually, maybe your belief system's just not the right belief system. And maybe that's what needs to change. Maybe your, your doctrine of this maximally controlling God needs to change because it's not fitting with what actually works, nor in my estimation, what's exegetically correct. Uh, increasingly be learns and becomes a Chalcedonian throughout his revisions of the institutes, and that becomes oh, really? sort of a a more a controlling motif. Mm, interesting. He he is certainly burdened by creedalism and wants to be faithful, but also wants to be faithful to the Reformation and his own personal conscience. That's one of the reasons that you know two reasons Calvin's commentaries are valuable for us. Number one, he was one of the first humanists to really write commentaries, and so. Uh, because he analyzed the text at the level of language rather than ideology, they're still useful for us. But then number two, 
because he was a man who's bound by his conscience. He, he was a, I mean, he was like the biggest fanboy in the world of Martin Luther and looked at that revolution and said, uh, I think it sparked in him permission to do what he felt was right, which at that time was not a thing to do. You know, it was not conce- it wasn't conceivable that that even could be the right thing to do. And because mm. he was a man of principle, of his own principle, I, I actually think Cal- one of Calvin's greatest virtues was that he he acted autonomously. He conceived himself as an autonomous individual, um, uh, in subservience to God. And so, and and so, what this brings us back to the problem of autonomy, which is, on the one hand, it can it can. By giving up autonomy, we can lend ourselves to an unhealthy fatalism that nobody wants, right? Even though even even the most stringent Calvinists, even Paul Helm or whoever, everybody's rejecting fatalism, right? Like nobody nobody says or nobody no Christians want to say or will really let themselves say because God's in control, I'm off the hook. But on the other hand, it's more about um, uh, uh, sort of pushing back on that notion and saying, you know. Um, there, there's that, there's that problem of sort of the the zero sum game of God's will and my will, will, which is not so simple as a zero sum game. It's not a zero sum game. But then there's the problem of dealing with God as the one who ordained your problems, you know, and all your pain, and and saying, can anything really make up for any of this? You know, when we see Job, for example, lamenting the 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 fact that he even exists, you know, he blames his mom, he blames God, he blames everybody that ever played a role in the fact that he had to go through what he went through. And he says, what the heck, you know, like what the actual heck? And um, at the end of the day, he just has to let go. He just has to let go. And so when he says that he, you know, that he repents at the end of the book, we can't take that as Job sinning, repenting from sin, because it, it says in all that he did, he did not sin. And mm. so what does it mean that he repented? Um, I think that that means that he just let go. And what he did is he gave into mystery. And by the end of the book, one of the reasons the book of Job is so long is because healing takes a very long time. And one of the reasons the book of Job is so confusing is because grief is very confusing. And so when we relate to God as autonomous individuals, I think there's often a sense that as we go to him with our grief, we have to go to him with grief in a manner where our even for our worst pain, we go to him with our tail between our legs because somehow it's my fault. You know, and there, there's a book, I think the evangelism in this, uh, what is it? The Sovereignty of God and the Supremacy of Christ, one of those John Piper books. Um, I, lo- I love John Piper, by the way, but it was another article not written by John where the guy said, he, he explicitly says, you know, God ordains every rape. Okay. And he's doing that from uh, an expositional passage, I think in first Corinthians, I forget which, but, or no, in Ephesians rather, rather. And, and I thought, um, hmm, okay, uh, that may be true. That may not be true, but if it is true, then, um, we have to deal with the serious psychological fallout of that for ourselves. And we cannot take that to be punishment. And, uh, I think that's, um, I think it was Nicholas Waltersdorf who wrote in his book where he grieved his son that much of our suffering may be punitive, but certainly not all of it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and unless we can conceive of a moral category for explaining our suffering, we are going to have a relational problem with God. And we are going to have to walk a path of healing that forces us to color outside the lines theologically, not because theology doesn't fit with reality, but because at every point in history, the church has been culturally situated. And insofar as it's culturally situated, there's going to be boundaries. And so there's nothing wrong with the fact that the church requires people to grieve a certain way. The church should be the place where uh, the church has, uh, where where people are sort of uh, encouraged to grieve a certain way. But I believe that um, the Apostle Paul, and this is one of the points I make in my dissertation, uh, uh, is that the Apostle Paul viewed excommunication as a mercy. Uh, And so certainly it was punitive, but when you excommunicate somebody, you free them from the constraints of church, which could be one of the best spiritual things for them they've ever. Did you hear that? Irony of our ironies when you hear what he's done. He's, He's excommunicated himself from the church. And notice how what, what how he describes that. That can actually be one of the most freeing things. Now, I agree with him that excommunicating the the lawless one among you, like he does uh, the church in Corinth, warn them once, warn them twice, warn them 
and then have nothing to do with them, cut them off so as not to enable them in their sin. Many of you know, I even wrote the, about that in my book, chapter six of my book, The Potter's Promise. Uh, I've talked about it quite regularly, how God cutting off Israel was actually an act of mercy so that they may be provoked to envy and grafted back in once they see the error of their ways. And that can be individually true as well. Cutting somebody off from the protection of the church can be a merciful thing because it helps them to find the pigsty of their life and see the error of their ways. And, and it can be, uh, in a sense, um, merciful to allow them to have that, that distance from the church so as to experience what it, what it feels like to be away from God's people and away from connection, intimacy. And it, it's exactly what Paul talks about him missing. He's, he's, he's missing the intimacy and the connection of apparently maybe something he had early in life that he doesn't have now, maybe because of COVID, maybe because of internet, things that he mentioned. I don't know what's going on with him. I don't mean to try to psychologize him. I have no idea what he's personally going through in life. But the fact that he, he talks about feeling free for the very first time and happy for the very first time because he's excommunicated himself from the church as he knows it, the reformed tradition. Um, and, and all that it entails and all the, the mystery, the apparent contradictions that he's just talked about, these, these difficulties of God ordaining child rape for his own self-glorification, which he's acknowledged was teach what's taught by Calvin and Calvinist from John Piper's ministry, um, and, and how that plays itself out and the freeing aspect of stepping away from that. So it really becomes down to the, this question of, is he being freed from Christianity generally, or is he being freed from what he is deemed as Christianity, i.e. the Reformed tradition? That that really is the question. Experienced. It could be one of the best things you do for the relationship with God, not because now they're cut off from, from communion with Christ, but maybe they were cut off from communion with Christ because of the constraints of church. And these are the complex realities that we have to hold, which is to say, we recognize the goodness of everything the church is tasked to do and recognize that it's never going to do everything perfectly. And that's okay. But we also recognize the dignity of having to go on your own hero's journey outside the walls of the church in a way that doesn't always make sense. You don't always have somebody telling you what the right next step to take is. Every single human being that we look back to as a hero of the faith had to do this. Okay, so you talk about his own hero's journey. Um, and the irony of that is seeing this video once again from his exit, his excommunication. He's excommunicated himself from the church and talks about how freeing he is and talks about how everyone has to go on this hero's journey. Again, this was only eight months ago that he recorded this. Is there is there not a pattern that you're seeing here as he's questioning his own Reformed faith, the claims of his Reformed tradition, uh, acknowledging how people say, well, you just don't get it. You don't understand it. No, I'm a PhD teaching at your seminaries and your colleges. I get this stuff. I understand its claims. Um, I understand where Calvin was coming from. I understand what Calvin was saying and how practically it does not work when it comes to the traumatized victims that I'm dealing with in my psychological training and how I deal with people and their, 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 the, the rubber meets the road issues of their life. And so listen, when, when this, this is true in so many different areas, I, I know I teach on this when I was teaching young people and teaching teenagers that, that, that the guilt that people feel is a friction. And what causes that friction? It's when your beliefs are going one direction and your behavior is going another direction. That's a friction between those two things, right? Belief, I believe, um, I believe that you should be pure of mind and heart, but I'm looking at pornography regularly. It's one of my, my, part of my testimony, one of the things that I struggled with in my college years especially, is so I believe that you should be pure of mind and heart, but I'm doing something that's not a pure of mind and heart. And so there's a, there's a belief and a behavior that are going two different directions. And that friction between those two things is called guilt. It's the conscience going, there's something wrong. It didn't feel good. And you have to either change your beliefs or your behavior. One of the two has to change in order for that guilt to go away. And now you, you can ignore both of them. And eventually there's a, a callousness that that's formed by the friction to the point where you don't feel the friction anymore. You don't feel the pain anymore. That can happen. Or you have to change the belief or the behavior to get rid of that anger, that tension, that, that straining. And that's exactly what, at least in my estimation, based upon my experiences with coming out of Calvinism, that it seems like Paul is experiencing right here is he's, he's experiencing this grief, this tension between the belief of God's 
maximal control over all events in all of human history and the, the actual practicality of how that plays itself out in a real world dealing with people who are going through trauma. And then that, that friction between those two is causing the angst, the, the struggle, the, 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 the guilt, maybe even, the, the difficulty, the defense mechanisms of trying to defend a God that seems indefensible from your own claims, the, your own worldview. And eventually when you finally just go, oh, I'm going to step away from that. Now I don't have to defend it anymore. I don't have to defend my version of what God looks like anymore. And there's this feeling of freedom. I'm actually happy as he goes on to say, I want you to listen again to his, now that you heard him explain all those things, let's go back to his um, his social media announcement of leaving the Christian faith. And, and it, it comes a lot more clearly now when you hear what he went through and now what he's come to, the conclusion he's come to. Listen, let's listen to him one more time. My parents would take me here every day when I was a kid. And uh, I really miss it here. But it, it reminds me most that what I really miss is connection with people. And I think the internet has done a lot, a lot of damage to that. Okay, so the first part of his testimony, he's talking about something I think we've all struggled with at times in our life, especially after a pandemic that, you know, keeps everybody in their houses and away from each other from uh, connections. My wife and I have been talking about that even more recently about how a lot of the friendships that we once had that were cultivated quite regularly and easily, um, you know, a lot of them were distance because of the social distancing of COVID and internet does lend, lend, lend itself more to that as well with all of the streaming, social media streaming and all the online chats and the things that we do here that, that those, those disconnections happen. So that's a part of his testimony of feeling just disconnected from the relationships he once had. So he's obviously reflecting upon a, a time in life where he remembers having those kinds of connections with other people um, emotional connections with people and he's longing for that. And so you sense, you sense some of that there. Um, Bill McPherson, thank you for your super chat. He says, he says, he sounds like he left God and joined the kingdom of this world. Um, and, and that's, that's sometimes exactly what you'll see is someone leaving not only God, but their version of what God looks like. Um, and this has been a part of my own personal testimony with some friends that I've known who have who've become atheist, um, or people that I know of who've become atheist. And when I asked them their version of God and who God is, I could understand why they left him because that version of this God who's just ready to smite them and ready to, to pounce on them every time they've made a mistake and not a God of unconditional love, not a God who desires their best well-being, not a God who's, who, who's truly self-sacrificial, but a God who is ultimately tr just a kind of a glory hog in the sky. That's just a me monster. that's trying to get everything for himself and doesn't matter who he has to step on to get it. And it's just always judgmental and coming down on everybody and, 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 and hate filled and all these kinds of versions of God. And I'm wondering, well, I, I I'm surprised you stayed with that version of God as long as you did. And, and sometimes I have to help people to understand the version of God you left is not the version of God that I see in Christ. And so I, I sometimes I end up evangelizing them again into the faith to introduce them the God of Christ, the God that's revealed through Christ, not the God that they've come to understand, uh, I think, wrongly. But what I've discovered is that I'm ready to connect again. And I'm kind of ready not to be angry anymore. So right there, I'm ready not to be angry anymore. See, to me, I, you know, I understand... I understand that feeling. I remember I remember feeling that exact way when I left Calvinism and just became a provisionistic Christian. I didn't have to be angry anymore. It felt like there was just that that negative quality of having feeling like I had to defend an indefensible view of who God was and that I just I just lost this anger. Now I can't say for sure that's what Paul's actually dealing with. I don't know, but it certainly seems as if one who intellectually, very intellectual person here, PhD, esteemed by even the, the greatest scholars among the Reformed tradition, has written articles upon articles on these topics. 
um, has proven himself to be knowledgeable of what he believes is true. Um, and, and for him to say that he's doesn't have to be angry anymore. There's a lot behind those words. What causes someone to build up anger and angst? Many of you know what that feels like, especially if you've been involved in a church that's been bickering and fighting. If any of you have been a part of church splits and there's just this people who are supposed to be loving and kind to each other are vitriolic and mean to each other more so than even experience in the secular world. And I've had this, I've had these kinds of testimonies from people who have been hurt so much by the church that they see the, the pain that the church has caused within their, their own local body, that they equate that with their version and understanding of who God is. And so they step away from that church, that unhealthy atmosphere, that unhealthy uh, interaction between people who are vitriolic and mean towards one another. And all of a sudden they just feel freed. And like, I don't have to deal with that committee meeting anymore. I don't have to deal with that, that hateful person anymore shouting me down and, and trying to take away my local body. I, I'm just freed from that local um, mess uh, of a body of people. And, and what do people who, what do pastors have to do who people who have left the church altogether because of a bad of experience, bad experience with an abusive pastor, whether Calvinist or not, by the way, I'm not, that's not uniquely Calvinistic. There's a lot of abusive pastors who are not necessarily Calvinistic. Um, but, but abusive just in the sense of being uh, overly demanding or mean or emotionally cruel or abusive to people within their church to, in order to get what they want to manipulate people. And, and how many times do pastors have to counsel people to understand that what you experience from that pastor is not a reflection upon God, our father. It's not a reflection upon the biblical version of who God is. And that can happen from a theological vantage point, as well as just a practical vantage point of the outplay of a person in their particular context of the local church. And it seems to me that that's very possibly what maybe Paul experienced in his own local context in his own faith journey and his own experience with who God is and in his intellectual journey, both into and out of Christianity slash reformed theology, maybe has led him to this point. I love you guys, and I love all the support and friendships I've built here. And um, I think I think it's important to say that I'm just not I'm just not a Christian anymore. And it feels really good. I'm really happy. Does that look like somebody who's happy? It looks like somebody who is torn to me. Now, again, I don't know Paul. And so maybe this is the way he, that that's the way he expresses happiness. Um, but to me, it seems like somebody who's really, really going through, it's almost trying to convince himself he's happy. And maybe there is a sense of feeling relief because I'm not bound to that system of thought and way of thinking and defending this way of thinking of who I am and who I am in relation to my creator. Maybe there is a sense of freedom from that, but what I see is not happiness. I'm really happy. And I can't wait to discover what kind of connection I can have with all of you beautiful people. So what's he looking for? What's, what's behind this? What's, what's he looking for? Looking for connection. He's looking for unconditional love. It's the same thing we're all looking for, isn't it? To be fully known, but yet to be loved. That, that's God. What's he looking for? He's looking for God. He's looking for somebody who knows him completely and fully and loves him unconditionally. And in all his experience with the Christian church, he hasn't found that yet. And that is so tragic because it's in, God, that he'll find that. Someone who knows us fully, but loves us completely. That is the unconditional love of the Father. And yes, he does love all people, so much so that he's willing to send his own son to die for the sins of all people, so that all may step into relationship with him. What's Paul looking for? He's looking for unconditional love and connection. 
He thinks he's going to find that with people, maybe because of past experience with people who have unconditionally loved him throughout his life. I pray that he experiences that in his life of being fully known and yet loved by a person here on earth. But I hope and pray that he finds that from more than just a person here on earth, that he discovers that he can have that between him and his God. That once you come to understand God as revealed by Christ, you can know and understand that God does fully know you and still loves you. As I try to figure out what's next, I love you guys. I'm in a really good spot. Probably the best, best spot of my life. And I'm so full of joy for the first time. I love my life for the first time. I love myself for the first time. I love my life for the first time. I've experienced joy for the first time, and I love myself for the first time. Now, again, I, I can't speak to the... Uh, I'm, I'm taking him at his word when he says that. Um, I, I don't know what's going on deep inside of Paul's life. Nobody, nobody does. Um, but when I, when I hear words like that, especially from somebody who has been a theologian and a minister and in the church and a part of the church, uh, claiming to be a Christian and a follower of Christ, and I hear them saying, I feel joy for the first time. Again, what is it that they have been separated from that caused them not to have the type of joy that he's experiencing now, that he has excommunicated himself from the church? that he has now stepped away from the place that apparently was damaging him. The very book that he wrote was about how reformed theology damages those who've gone through trauma. I don't know Paul's journey. I don't know what he went through. But some, sometimes people who go into psychology, and this is true in my own experience with people I know, usually go into psychology because they have been damaged in some way, and psychology therapy has helped them come through a traumatic event in their own life. I'm suspecting, and I don't know, I'm suspecting that Paul has gone through some traumatic event throughout his life. And whatever he experienced in the church did not provide what he was seeking from healing from his understanding of who God is, and his understanding of how God responds to us in our trauma. And I understand where he's coming from when he says that, because there's often times when we feel as Paul did, um, as, as David did through the Psalms, unsatisfied with the way in which God is related to them individually and personally at a given moment or time. God, where are you in my grief? Where are you in my struggle? Where are you in my pain? Again, be honest. David was, Peter was, Paul was. This is one of the one. This is one of the things that the reason I love the Bible so much is it doesn't hide the pain and the doubt and the disillusionment of the greatest followers of the faith. And I'm so glad that it doesn't because it makes me feel like I fit. How about you? I fit here because I know what it feels like to have the doubt and disillusionment of where is my God during this grief or this trial or this hardship. Where is? God when I don't see him and he doesn't relate to me in the way that I need to be related to. I mean, all of us deep down from the time of Moses who said, God, just show me your face. I just want to see you and hides him in the cleft of the rock and just lets him see a glimpse and he's glowing. What, what is that whole story? About? It's about man wanting to see a tangible, touchable source of God's love and power. I just want to see you, God. I just want to touch something. I, I struggle with this. Can't, I, I remember laying in bed at night as a kid, God, Make the ceiling fan. Come on, if you're real, if you're there, if you're listening to me, if you love me, if you're there, make that pencil hover across the room. Show me something. Why do we do this? Why does the Bible talk about it's the it's the the perverse and corrupt generations that look for signs and wonders? What is it we're looking for when we're asking God, show me something? Why is it there's so many communities and tribes and people who build idols to touch? because they want to worship their God that they can see and touch and contain. Seems like an innate desire within all of us to have some tangible source of our creator's love and power that's containable and touchable and tangible. 
And in some ways, he answered that need by sending Jesus incarnate. God became the tangible source of God's love and power in the world through Jesus Christ who walked among us. It might be good enough for the apostles who actually got to touch his nail-scarred hands like Thomas did, but what about me? What about us today, God? You're no longer in the world. You have left us here, and yet there's still that innate desire, it seems like, within all of us to see, to see, to touch, to feel the nail-scarred hands when we have our doubts. You did it for Thomas. Why not for me? Why not show me a little bit more, God? Why not just turn on the ceiling fan when I'm nine years old and asking for a sign? Why not just make the pencil hover across the room and reveal your glory and your power so that I don't doubt anymore? Why not? I mean, it'd be simple for you to do something like that, God. Why not do it? In my own faith journey, I had to learn that if I would have had that prayer answered in the way that I wanted it answered, guess what would have happened to my faith? My faith would have turned from looking to God who is at work around me and in me and through this world, through circumstances and life and ways in which he's revealed himself by means of faith, and it would have turned me to looking for what? Another sign and another wonder. What would, it, what, would it, what would that have done to the people around me, my older brothers and my parents, if I would have gone to them and said, God, last night God caused a pencil to hover in my bedroom? Think about what would have happened. Think about it. What would have happened? What, what if I came on this program to, and say to you, hey, just now I was sitting here and my pencil started hovering in my room when I asked God to show himself to me. What would that do to you? What would you think? One, you would, you would think, the ones of you who are the intellectualistic types that don't believe everything you hear, you would say, okay, Layton's loony now. He's gone Pentecostal and he's weird. And uh, he's, he's claiming, eh, goofy. Okay. And you would tune me out completely. That's, that's one reaction. What would be the second reaction? For those of you who actually believe that something hovered in my bedroom, my, my room here, in order to demonstrate God's power to me personally, what would you do if you believe me? God, do you love me as much as you love Leighton? Could, could you do what you did for him for me? And, and where, does, where does their vision go from? It goes from listening to God through faith and listening to the still small voice in our, our conscience that God has given us and listening to him and learning from him and going to the scriptures and reading the, the words that he's revealed to us. And what does it go? It turns to what? Magic tricks. God, show me a magic trick as if that's going to satisfy. The reason the scriptures say that it's a perverse generation that looks for signs and wonders is because the perverse generation that looks for signs and wonders is never, never satisfied by the sign or the wonder. They always want more every single time. Because if he would have showed himself through hovering some pencil across the room when I was nine years old, guess what I would have wanted when I was 13 years old or 15 years old or 18 years old as the memory of that floating pencil faded and I began to rationalize as to what could have happened to cause it. Instead of learning to mature in my faith and learning to look inwardly at the Holy Spirit's voice within my life, guiding me and giving me peace and direction, I would have been looking outwardly. I would have been looking at the temporal world, the fading world that passes by versus the eternal. That's the spirit that's working around me and in me and through my life. I would have never learned to listen to his voice that's speaking to me daily. It would have been detrimental to my walk with the, the, in faith and my walk with God if God would have given me a sign at the age of nine when I asked for it, just as it would be detrimental to everyone who heard the testimony of it. Because either, like I said, you would think I was loony and crazy and write me off, or you would think, I want what Leighton had. God, show me a sign, show me a wonder, show me a magic trick so that I will finally believe and trust in you. That's not the way our God has chosen to relate to us. He's chosen to relate, whether you believe it's true or right or wrong, what the Bible says, he's chosen to relate to us through faith. He has chosen for us to relate to him through the still small voice that he has given to each and every one of us through the conscience of our hearts by residing within us and guiding us. And if we're still and we're quiet enough and we turn off Netflix long enough and we put down the phone long enough, and we actually tune in and we actually listen, we can hear him guide us. 
And when we're so distracted by everything that's within us, around us, within the world, pulling at us, fighting for our attention, grabbing for us, we can slowly lose connection with his voice because he doesn't speak to the storm and the hurricane. He speaks, he speaks to the whispers, the very still small voice that are drowned out by the noise of this world, the noise of Satan and everyone who's trying to distract us by what, whatever wind and wave of doctrine that may be coming down the pike. And if I can do anything to encourage at least those of you who are tuning into this broadcast and those of you who minister to other ministers and other Christians who are also struggling with their faith and help them not to learn, look externally to the things that are temporal, but to look internally to the thing that is eternal, infinite, the Holy Spirit that resides within each one of us who claim to believe and follow God. That guide, that spirit can be the very connection point that we're looking for if we understand our God is who he truly claims to be through Jesus Christ, one who loves and provides the salvation of all people. I pray that what I have shared today is not you know, overly contentious with regard to my Calvinistic friends. It's not my desire. I, I, don't, I don't desire to um, theologize these issues so much so that, that everything that I say is anti-Calvinistic, as if I'm just against all Calvinist altogether and just you know, I'm angry at Calvin. Some people, uh, I, I think, get that impression that because I've started a podcast about my own journey in and out of Calvinism, that I just automatically do everything uh, because it's anti-Calvinistic. And that's really not been my goal. My goal in starting this broadcast is not just about being anti-Calvinistic and, and, you know, yelling down Calvinist. I, I hope and, and pray that you understand that my own journey out of Calvinism and the, ex, the experience that I had, much like maybe what Paul experienced in coming out of his version of Christianity, I, I experienced more joy and peace and understanding of who I believe God is when I came away from the Reformed tradition that I want others to experience the true aspect of what I've come to understand God to be in my own journey. That's where it comes down to. Don't, don't, don't you want others to experience joy when you experience joy? Of course you do. When you have that experience, whether it's watching a movie or you go to some event or you maybe a vacation or something that you've done and you experience that, you want other people to experience it. So you talk about it. That's exactly what this broadcast was started for. I wanted to talk about the experience that God's brought me through in my own faith journey, my understanding of what scripture teaches with regard to what it means to follow God and how that practically plays itself out in a person's life. And I pray that it's edifying to you and to the body of Christ. God bless. See you next time. Bye-bye.